Today I'm going to be introducing Spectator Histogram. This is a small, fast alternative to data sketches or t-digests for being able to do percentile approximations in Druid. Hi, my name is Ben Sykes. I'm a software engineer at Netflix. I operate Netflix's largest real-time Druid cluster, keep it running so that we can keep up with ever-increasing query volume and ever-increasing data volume. First, I'd like to start by looking at some data. I'll be using this example throughout. And this is a sample of network traffic from my machine. It captures the, the source and destination, host and port, and the payload size. So as you can imagine, this gets very big very quickly if you're heavily using your machine. We've got a nice amount of variability here. There are a huge number of uh, different hosts involved and largely different packet sizes. So first of all, we may want to roll up this data. So as I said, this is a, a relatively small sample and we initially start out with 2 million rows of data, which isn't a big deal, but this is one machine and it was sampled for a few hours. So if we do roll up, it may look something like this. This is a representation of that data that we have on the left, as it would be rolled up to the second grain. So we can see that multiple of the rows that share identical source host, source port, and destination host, and destination port will be landing on the same row. And then we aggregate the count and we aggregate the packet size. So we're able to collapse these 20 rows into these six rows here. But rollup is inherently lossy. We're reducing the information that we are able to store deliberately so that we have less data to store, but also we're reducing what we can get from that data. So if we go with a pure sum aggregator, as we have in this case, then we're kind of reduced to being able to only compute the total of all of the, the packet sizes involved in our query and the mean, because we have the count. That may be sufficient in a number of cases, but for things like network traffic, probably not the most useful. So if we were able to look at across the entire distribution of our packet sizes, you'd see that there's a lot more detail here. Network traffic is inherently multimodal, where, well, looking at the packet size anyway, where um, there will be a lot of very small packets, like your SYN packets, for example, and your X have no payload, so there'll be zero. Whereas we have another whole set of traffic in this case that's anchored around that 1200 mark, which is trying to maximize uh, payload for RTP traffic for a FaceTime call. We have an absolute maximum for a standard TCP network of 15, 20 or thereabouts, I forget the, the actual detail. And then there are a bunch of other things, like you have pings that are typically 64 bytes and, um, and a whole variability in between. So the red line here is representing the mean. If we had only that single data point, it wouldn't be particularly useful um, and tell us a lot of information about what's going on in this network trace. So we can represent distributions as time series as well. And if we look on the left here, we have purely just the average. And you can see during my FaceTime call there, about 25 minutes or so, the average jumps up and stays pretty stable. And then as the FaceTime call finishes and we get back to regular browsing and do some GitHub work, the, uh, the average drops off quite a bit, um, but it doesn't really tell us all that much. If we look on the right hand side, where we're plotting a, a median and a distribution between the 25th and 75th percentile range now, you can see that when we get to that FaceTime call, the range is actually quite narrow. And that's probably because most of the network is being used by that one application. I'm not doing anything else. There'll be some background tasks for sure. But um, the large majority of the data flowing at that point is that FaceTime call which is trying to optimize the packets for deliverability in that uh, real-time protocol. And then once that session finishes and we go back to regular browsing and do some GitHub stuff, there's 
far more variability in the size of the packets. And we can actually see that the median drops way down compared to where the average is, um, is landing. So we've got a lot more rich information there. So hopefully you're sold that, yes, we definitely want distributions, but they come at a cost, of course. Everything comes at a cost. So why are we making another sketch and distribution implementation? Well, the short answer is that T-Digest and data sketches are too big. So as the row count increases, our storage count and the server footprint really add up quickly. While these implementations are perfectly quick to query, we would end up with either more segments because we're trying to keep the same number of uh, bytes per segment, potentially, or if we keep the same number of rows per segment, then the segments are going to be bigger. In either case, we're going to end up with more data to store, and this is going to be at a real cost. So that the storage alone, maybe not a big deal if you're putting it into S3 or something like that, it's relatively cheap, but still it's a, a percentage difference. The bigger cost is really on the instances. So if we want to be able to keep the same percentage of our rows in memory, if the rows are bigger, then we're going to need more memory. So either bigger machines or more machines, and that is a real, real cost. And lastly, which may not be interesting for many people, we really wanted a, a storage layer that's compatible with existing Netflix tooling. So we have dashboards, we have automated alerting, we have um, analysis tools that will monitor A-B tests. And these all work with an existing in-memory data set. So we wanted to be compatible with that layer and be able to represent our data in the, a similar way at query time so that um, we could build on top of these tools. So I say this is the TLDR because if you care for more information, we presented on this exact topic last year. And you can find our comparison between T-Digest, data sketches, and spectator histogram in this presentation. And I made a short link for you, so it's easier to find. So I claim that it's smaller, but how small is it? Um, obviously, we need to have a, a good win for making this effort to build this tool. So I took the example Wikipedia dataset that comes with the standard Druid installation, and I ingested it three times. We did it as is with no rollup applied. We added a single column, extra column of spectator histogram type, which was looking at the added column within that data set. I'm not sure what added actually represents, whether it's the number of pages, the number of bytes or, or whatnot. <clears throat> and then I ingested the same thing again, adding a single metric column of a data sketch, Quantile's double sketch, the same column again. So as we can see in this example, we end up with 24,000 rows. In this case, actually, there is no roll-up applied. It, um, it, it is a, a one measure per row kind of thing. <clears throat> and spectator histograms add just six bytes over the base case. So the base case being 260 bytes per row on average, and then adding that one extra uh, spectator histogram column averages at 266 bytes per row. Whereas the data sketch adds an extra 48 bytes per row. So looking at the addition alone, that's an 8x improvement, which can be significant. So in this case, it's only 1.3 megabytes, but um, yeah, it all adds up when you get to significantly more rows and significantly more columns. So you may say that this is an unfair comparison because there's no roll-up involved here, so maybe data sketches has an overhead, and that might be true. So we took my network flow data and ingested that as well. So rolling up to a minute grain, since network segments are uh, frequently talking back and forth between the same hosts, we get really good roll-up in this case. So we're looking at a 50, 57x roll-up, meaning that on average, we've been able to put 57 rows worth of raw CSV logs onto a single row within Druid. 
So the first um, data source here is the minute grain roll-up using no additional sketches. That's doing the, the sum and the count that we looked at earlier. And we have an average row size of 30 bytes. We do the same thing and add the spectator histogram column for the packet size. And we end up with 39 bytes. So we're looking at about a nine byte increase in this case. And then the same with the data sketch. And it's much bigger, 135 bytes per row. So that's a huge difference. Um, if you look at the base case versus the sketch, we see um, like a 5x in, uh, increase there just for adding that one distribution measure. Um, and you can see that the roll up here compared to the very raw, fully unrolled up data source being the 2 million rows there. And we managed to get down to 39 million, 39,000 rows. So significant improvement. So we're able to get all of that extra detail we want starting to show or being able to show those um, multimodal features of this data set with just nine bytes per row. So we can quite safely add multiple of these columns if we had more um, measurements within our data set. And it's barely more than the cost of a counter. So if you think of a long counter being eight bytes and this is only nine bytes, then why not? So how do we get down to just nine bytes? Well, uh, we make some compromises, of course. As with many things, being opinionated and um, making some trade-offs is the way to win one thing against another. So for the spectator bucketing scheme, we use fixed buckets. There are 276 of them, and they cover the full long um, number space from zero to long max value. As you may notice, this comes with a trade-off. So the trade-off being that your data must be represented as longs, and we don't support negatives. If you want anything out of that case, then data sketches is probably your way. So the, the buckets are not evenly spaced. As the measurement gets larger, the bucket width gets larger. This is a, a deliberate choice so that when you're measuring small things, you have more accuracy than when you're measuring big things. Most of the, of the measurements we make are from server-side um, iterations or client-side iterations or network iterations. So we're typically measuring small values or um, things in, in real time. So when we're operating at the nanosecond level, kind of rare, I guess, um, then you want the precision of a single nanosecond. If you're operating in the millisecond range or the microsecond range, then you want relatively accurate times there. Mm -hmm. But as you start to get up into the seconds, having some variability of a few hundred milliseconds isn't such a big deal. So it, it is a, a, a largely increasing bucket width as the values themselves get larger. So it kind of maintains some relative um, accuracy, absolute accuracy drops off. Yep. So the, uh, the trade-offs there are that you've got to use longs or, or integers, I guess, and they've got to be positive. We don't support decimals. If you want to use decimals, then you'll have to scale uh, to maintain your precision. So how do we get to histograms? Let's take a very small sample from our earlier log and look at what happens. So with rollup enabled, these four samples will all end up on the same row because they have the same source IP, source port, destination IP, and destination port. So all dimensions of values are the same. So looking at those packet size values or payload size values, we'll see that there's a 0, a 1448, a 1448, and a 759. So let's start out and accumulate these into a histogram using a spectator histogram fixed book implementation. We'll start with an empty histogram. We'll add the 0, which falls into the 0 to 1 bucket, bucket ID 0. So we increment the counter for the 0 bucket. 
So next we'll add the 1448 sample, which falls into this bucket range, bucket ID 43. And we accumulate the counter for that. And again, we have another 1448, same bucket, same ID. And we increment the counter again, so we can see that there are two in that bucket now. And then finally, the 759 falls into this bucket with bucket 38, and we increment the counter for that. So carrying over that same example, there were actually more pack packets between those two hosts during this uh, same minute window, which had these samples. So if we take our first histogram and these other his uh, values from this histogram, we can simply add the, the, uh, the buckets and the counts together. It's kind of like merging a hash map where we uh, accumulate the values and add the keys if they're missing. And we end up in this resulting hash map, uh, hash map and histogram. So given that we store this effectively as a hash map under the hood, but we have a very constrained key space, i.e. a 0 to 275, and we know that the values are always numbers and integers at that, or, or longs, we can use a highly optimized bit packing mechanism to store this in very few bytes. So we're able to take these nine measurements that we had and represent them in just 10 bytes. And as we add more and more samples, if they happen to be in for the same buckets, this gets more and more efficient. So given, having those trade-offs of fixed buckets and only longs and only positive numbers really allows us to optimize the storage that we use. So taking this example and adjusting it into a real Druid instance, we can see that these values are rolled up and how they're represented. In this case, we show them as JSON here, but under the hood, they're really stored in this compressed binary format. Okay, so let's query it. So th this is an example using an internal dashboard. We're pointing at my test Druid cluster that I just showed you. And we're able to query for the number of packets per second, the traffic as megabits per second, and we plot the payload size as both the mean and the median. And as from a, per our earlier example, we can see that the median um, drops down a lot more than the mean once the uh, the traffic has settled back to more variable levels of just browsing and playing with GitHub. So then we can add our range back onto this and we can see that that confirms the case, right? So while I was on the FaceTime call, the uh, packet sizes are, are largely uniform. And then once we get back to other types of interactions, pings and GitHub interactions and browsing, it's far more variable. So we get that rich set of information um, just from that extra nine bytes per row. So in that last brief demo there, I showed using an internal dashboard. So what was happening? We, our browser connects to the internal dashboard to load the page and the definition of the charts that we want to render. The queries are actually sent directly to this Atlas Druid bridge. And we do that so that we can issue the queries in Atlas stack language. The reason we do that is so that we can be compatible with all the other tooling that we have. It gives us a lot of power. There's a lot of uh, maths built into the, the stack language itself. So you can do some quite complicated um, transforms on the queries. And we're able to target alternate data stores or the Druid data store in a seamless way. So the queries go to this Atlas Druid bridge and that then transforms them into Druid queries. It's using them to Druid, gathers the results, does its maths on it needs to do, transform them back into result sets, back up to the browser, which are then rendered in the charts. Now, I can't share the internal dashboard implementation with you, because it's not all open source. The bridge is, Druid is, and so I made a temporary crude demo UI 
so that there was something that we could share and you can follow along with this demo if you wanted to. That's going to be very similar in that we load the page from the demo UI and the, the queries go directly to the Atlas Druid bridge. However, I also added some convenient buttons to load some sample data sets into Druid so that UI also uses the Druid APIs to load those samples. So if you want to follow along, you can go grab the demo and all of the Docker files from this repo. And I will show you what that looks like right now. So we go check out that repo. We'll take a look at what's inside. A bunch of Docker files and some configs. It also includes the sample data set if you want to play with that. So we'll build all these containers. I should say that the prerequisite to this is that you've already built the forked version of Druid that includes the, uh, the spectator scrum module. So this is all started up. We have our Atlas container wait for Druid to be fully up before it starts itself so that it can query to get the list of data sources which is nothing right now. So we see we're running 29 snapshot here, no data sources. Good, it's a nice blank implementation. So this is the crude demo UI I made with the convenient buttons for loading sample data. So here we load the uh, Wikipedia sample by kicking off an ingestion into Druid through the API. Um, one thing I couldn't solve in time for the, this demo was to tell our Atlas Druid bridge to refresh its metadata. Um, when we deploy for, for real in production, it refreshes the, the list of data sources and then the, um, the metrics and the dimensions that you can query from those on a 10 minute cadence. And um, I wasn't able to make uh, an API to refresh that any quicker. So if you want to see it more quickly, you can go bounce that container and it will refresh immediately on startup, which is what I just done. So um, you can look at that and then we can refresh the chart here. So that is, this is Wikipedia data. It's looking at the sum of the added column. Not sure what that is. Um, and we've plotted it using this Atlas query for a sum of the added split by whether it's new or not. So we're looking here at the at some added column, this is Atlas stack language here. We're filtering out all of the robot changes to be false, summing it up, splitting by as new, and then adding a legend there. So we can change this um, to use our histogram instead. And one of the features of the histogram is if you query it as a sum, it will give you the count of the samples. So this helps you avoid needing to ingest a separate counter just to count how many entries were included, which we can't do in our demo anyway, because we added the count column. But um, this can help by giving you that for free. But that's not the main point of this column, right? The main point of this column is to give us the distribution. So we can change our query and ask for the median instead. Need to put after the group plate. So then we have the median. So we'll see that generally the uh, new is bigger than the not new. Kind of makes sense, I guess. People are probably adding whole documents rather than um, edits being a few characters at a time, maybe. So we don't know too much about the underlying data in this data set. So let's load our um, sample. NetFlow data instead, and we can take a look at that. So again, this kicks off a ingestion, and we can go bounce the bridge and then come back and query it. So here we're plotting our data set. We're looking at packet size, and we're plotting the 25th, 50th, 75th, 90th, and 99th percentiles of the packet sizes. And we've zoomed into our FaceTime call again, where we can see that the range comes together. And then after that call finishes, the distribution of traffic is far more varied. 
feel free to play around with the query um, in the demo. The, there was a link out to Atlas Net language and documentation for how to compose these queries. So you can see what you can do. So this will be ready soon. The PR making this an extension is open. In the meantime, uh, if you want to get started with it, you can check out my fork. We've been using this internally since 016, so it should be largely compatible with earlier versions. And uh, we're currently running it on 026, hoping this will make it into 29's official release, but we'll, we'll see. So in summary, if you want percentile approximations and you want them to be fast and accurate, the same as data sketches, uh, significantly lower storage cost, have a large data set so that the costs cost savings are meaningful, and critically only use positive measurements, then this may be an option for you. Here are the resources. So we've got the demo that you can check out and um, run it yourself. There's the link to the comparison from last year's Druid Summit, where we look at data sketches and T-digest versus the histogram. And then there's my fork, which adds this contribution as an extension.